Welcome. I'm Amory Lovins, a recovering physicist, former Oxford Don and energy advisor to firms and governments worldwide. I'm teaching a course called Extreme Energy Efficiency at Stanford University and helping other practitioners around the world to design super efficient buildings, vehicles, factories, and equipment to help advanced energy efficiency speed the renewable energy revolution and thus profitable climate protection. Today, I'd like to remind you about how to design whole systems for radical energy efficiency or other resource efficiency, and thus to make climate protection, again, not costly, but profitable. This practice applies orthodox engineering principles, but it asks different design questions in a different order to get different answers. A little history. Around 1975, US government and industry all said that the energy needed to make a dollar of GDP could never go down. A year later, I heretically suggested it could drop 72% in the next 50 years. So far, it's dropped 60% in 45 years. Yet just the innovations already added since 2010 can already save another threefold, twice what I originally thought, and a third the real cost. Today, that even that heresy looks conservative because optimizing whole systems together, not as just piles of little parts, can often make very big energy savings cost less than smaller no savings, turning diminishing returns into increasing returns. And we'll see how. Now, economic geologists know that a mineral's economically extractable reserves are only a small part of the whole resource base, but can expand with innovation. Similarly, reserves of conventional energy efficiency, like the bright green zone in these mineral resource definitions, are several folds smaller than the full efficiency resource exploitable by integrative design. Yet ore bodies are finite and depletable concentrations of atoms, while energy efficiency resources are infinitely expandable assemblages of ideas, depleting only stupidity, a very abundant resource. That's documented in this free paper with a nifty four minute video abstract. It's evidence across all sectors shows that unlike say oil or copper, most new energy efficiency reserves cost less than what we're producing now because they come not from adding more or fancier devices but from using fewer and simpler devices more artfully chosen, combined, timed and sequenced. So how do we do this magic? One of my early mentors, the inventor Edwin Land of Polaroid fame said, don't undertake a project unless it is manifestly important and nearly impossible. He also said, people who seem to have had a new idea have often just stopped having an old idea. That's the hard part. Asian tradition similarly urges us to seek original mind, beginner's mind, child mind, opening ourselves to new ideas by shedding all assumptions and preconceptions. That's the first and the hardest step in the method of integrative design. Thus with beginner's mind, never having built a house, so I didn't know what was impossible, that made it possible. In 1982, I did the conceptual and energy design of this owner builder house where my wife Judy and I still live near Aspen, Colorado at 2,200 meters elevation. The outdoor temperatures here used to dip as low as minus 44 Celsius with up to 39 days of continuous midwinter cloud. But our house does no combustion. That's so 20th century. Super insulation, ventilation, heat recovery, and super windows that insulate like 16 or even 22 sheets of glass would look like two and cost less than three, make this house 99% passive solar heated, 1% active solar. And the efficiency added less construction cost than eliminating the heating system subtracted, saving also about 90% of the electricity, 99% of the water heating energy and half the water, all paid back in 10 months with 1983 technologies. Today's technologies are a lot better and cheaper. Now the central atrium you see behind me and it's seen in the photo in a February snowstorm has so far produced 80 passive solar banana crops. Someone said I had really big earphones. Without needing to look like this, our house helped inspire several hundred thousand European passive buildings that likewise have no heating and roughly normal construction cost. 
An analogous approach even works fine in Bangkok. Nearly everyone on earth lives in climate somewhere between Bangkok's and mine. Integrative design gives many benefits from each expenditure. So the white arch above my head or in the upper uh, middle photo at the top has 12 different functions, but it has only one cost. We start then with the end use effect we want, and then to deliver it, optimize buildings as whole systems, not as a bunch of components, pay for the efficiency by shrinking the needed supply, maximize those capital savings by applying efficiency from downstream to upstream, as I'll elaborate shortly, reward the design professionals for what they save, not for what they spend, and optimize the sequence and the timing of design steps. Thus, to keep people, say, comfortable in hot places, first, cool the people, not the building, which has no comfort sensation. As in these hyper chairs at the nearby office of RMI in Basalt, Colorado, these chairs keep you comfortable in air temperatures up to about 30 Celsius with 3.6 watts of silent fans. Then you can expand the range of conditions in which people feel comfortable. For example, good ceiling fans expand the summer, summer comfort range by about five to seven Celsius degrees. Then minimize the unwanted heat and humidity gains within or into the space. Next, apply passive cooling. Then active but non-refrigerative cooling. Next would come super efficient refrigerative cooling like uh, Liang Locke's triple efficiency but cheaper Singapore, Singapore uh, mechanical systems. And next, if needed, would come cool storage and controls. But actually, we never need to get as far down the list as refrigerative cooling and not even usually active re non-refrigerative cooling either to save 90 to 100% of the cooling energy with better comfort and uptime and lower whole system capital costs, even in the most severe climates. Most practitioners pursue these options in reverse order, worst buys first. And lately steps four and five may just have become obsolete because some new Singapore experiments show that purely radiative cool delivery can suffice. And then you can get the cool uh, generated passively with no electricity by special radiators sending infrared back to the sky. Integrative design keeps improving. Our Empire State Building retrofit saved 38% of its energy, later 43%, with a three-year payback. Three years later, our cost-effective Denver retrofit saved 70%, making this half-century-old federal complex more efficient than what was then the best new U.S. office, which in turn is only a third as efficient as RMI's passive net positive, no mechanicals office near here. And now a Bavarian building is using two fifths less energy than that one. And its rooftop solar cells make five times more electricity than its three stories need. Yet these technologies all existed over a decade ago. What has mainly improved is not so much technology as design, how we put all the parts together. Let's try a simple example. Most designers think of energy efficiency as kind of like picking cookies from a jar. So if a cash constrained developer asked her architect to suggest ways to make say a new small office greener and more efficient, probably she'd be handed a list sort of like this and would conclude from the right hand column that few or no cookies pay back fast enough to be worth grabbing. Only one of them's under a two year payback. But if instead she had chosen everything on the list, then the better daylighting and the reduced internal heat gain would create a new ability to shift some of the windows around and to shrink the mechanicals for smaller loads. So most of efficiency's extra costs would be offset by the capital costs that they save. And the net cost, just over $4,000, would pay back in a year. That's faster than any of the measures independently. So the whole is much more than the sum of the parts. And we've helped design over a thousand buildings applying this principle around the world. Such integrative design even works in retrofitting old buildings. So our Empire State Building retrofit remanufactured all 6,514 windows on site in a temporary window factory that the Teamsters Union ran on a vacant floor. 
and made them into super windows that pass light through but block heat. And that plus better lights, office equipment, air handlers, and so on, cut the maximum cooling load by a third. But then renovating smaller chillers instead of adding bigger chillers saved $17 million of capital cost, paying for most of the other improvements and cutting the payback to three years or less than one year if we had counted non-energy benefits to the owner or the tenants. A major energy service company had also offered a three-year payback, but with disintegrated design, yielding only a sixth the savings that we got. Similarly, in six muggy Indian cities, one and a half million square meters of integratively designed offices use up to 80% less energy than the Indian norm, with 10 to 20% lower construction cost, yet superior comfort and satisfaction. Glare-free lighting, as you see in that big floor plate on the right, is delivered throughout by contract. If workers complain of glare and demand blinds, then the architect doesn't get paid. IPCC reported that for diverse building types and climates about a decade ago, the best European new buildings on the left and retrofits on the right, with bigger savings towards the right in both graphs, are saving up to at least 90% of their energy without raising the cost per unit of saved energy. The vertical cost scatter simply shows the business opportunity to conform the high cost inferior projects to the low cost projects best practices. Timing matters too. When you're retrofitting a big glass office tower, uh, maybe the glazing seals fail as they do every 20 years. Super windows plus efficient lights and equipment and daylighting can shrink mechanical loads uh, and systems by about fourfold. And that more than pays up front for the efficiencies that shrank them. A fourfold efficiency gain in the old Chicago office building like the rear uh, photo there could thus pay back in about negative five months. In other words, it's cheaper than the routine 20 year renovation that saves nothing. If you coordinate that deep retrofit with the routine renewal of the curtain wall facade, say when the glazing seals fail. Deep retrofits of all our big buildings is going to take decades. So let's right time them to make the savings much bigger and cheaper. Industry uses about half the world's energy and electricity. Across diverse sectors, RMI's 50 odd billion dollars worth of retrofit designs typically found about 30 to 60% energy savings paying back in a few years. And in new builds, about 40 to 90 plus percent savings with generally lower capital cost. That's far better than the oval brown retrofit zone the most energy service companies deliver as shown in the upper left corner. Our better results come from rethinking industrial processes and redesigning basic elements like pump and fan and motor systems. For example, in both buildings and industry, better pipe and duct design can save about 80 to 90% of the friction, 97% here in my house. And if everybody did this, it could save roughly a fifth of the world's electricity or half the coal-fired electricity, typically paying back in less than a year in industrial retrofits and instantly in new builds. Just as this house more than paid up front for super insulation by eliminating the heating system that the super insulation got rid of. So fatter pipes and ducts uh, can more than repay any higher first cost by shrinking the pumps, fans, motors, and power supplies. So such radical savings require two changes in our design process, our design mentality. First, we specify big pipes and small pumps, not small pipes and big pumps. Friction in a pipe falls as nearly the fifth power of its diameter. So how fat should the pipe be to optimize the friction? Well, the textbooks say to make the pipe just as fat as will repay its extra cost over the years from the safe pumping energy. But that's wrong because it leaves out the capital cost of the pumping equipment. A pumping system's pump, motor, inverters, electricals must all be big enough to overcome the friction. So their size and roughly their capital cost will fall as nearly the fifth power of pipe diameter. And yet the capital cost of the fatter pipe goes up as only about the second power of diameter. So when we optimize the pipe as a component, we're pessimizing the system. Instead, optimizing the whole system at once yields fat pipes and tiny pumping equipment so the total capital cost goes down. Okay, so far? 
Now the second shift in design is even simpler, therefore harder. And that's to lay out the pipes first, then the equipment. Traditionally, we put the tanks, boilers, whatever, in convenient, arbitrary, traditional places. And then we call in the pipe fitter to please come connect point A to point B. But by then, they'd be a pretty far apart. Other stuff got in between. They're at the wrong height. They face the wrong direction. And by the time the pipe snakes its way across the space, all dressed at neat right angles like they teach us in trade school, it has about three to six times the friction that it would have had with a straight shot. The pipe fitters like this because you pay them by the hour. They mark up the extra pipes and fittings. They're not paying for your bigger pumping system or, or electric bill, but they could better distinguish themselves in the market if they could offer the owner a far better value proposition by making the pipes fat, short, and straight rather than skinny, long, and crooked. Thus, low friction pipes make this blue pump so tiny, it looks like a decimal point error. And you notice it's raised up to meet the straight pipe rather than conventionally dipping the pipe down to meet a pump on the floor and then back up. Or the tan chillers that used to be in a neat row are staggered here to eliminate the pipe elbows by sliding everything around. And yet such rearrangement of designers' metal furniture remains largely unnoticed and unpracticed, not in yet in any standard engineering textbook government study, industry forecast, or climate model. Why not? Because it's not a technology. It's a design method. And few people yet think of design as a scaling vector, a way to make things big fast. Now, tenfold energy savings in, say, pumping, a venerable application, may seem incredible. And yet, your heart right now <clears throat> is pumping blood about 10 times as efficiently <clears throat> as typical industrial pumping systems do. If you're roughly 100,000 kilometers of fractal blood vessels down to the tiniest ones had the design and friction of standard industrial piping, you would need a heart bigger than your body, very inconvenient. But in fact, your third of a kilogram, one and a half watt heart suffices because your blood follows nature's standard design, laminar vortex flow. That's a whole other conversation about the other big design revolution, biomimicry or innovation inspired by nature like the way the nose of the Shinkansen bullet trains in Japan is inspired by the shape of a kingfisher bird's beak. But let's just stick with conventional components and better design for now. In, in California's Oakland Museum, our colleague Peter Rumsey retrofitted an efficient piping layout that cut the pumping energy by three fourths with a two or three month payback and eliminated 15 pumps that will never again waste energy and maintenance costs. Repiping another pumping loop, uh, then adding variable speed drive, doubled the flow and saved 85% of the energy. So Peter simply asked the pipe fitters to lay out those supply pipes as if they were drains. Or another case, uh, here's how most buildings pipe cooling tower water back to the condenser. But if we lay it out instead the way Peter does, everything gets better. The only obstacle is force of habit. We should bend mines, not pipes. What do such savings mean for the pumps and fans that use half the torque of the motors that use over half the world's electricity? Well, from the fuel burn to the power plant to the end use, many successive losses compound. So only a tenth of the energy in the fuel comes out the pipe as flow. But now turn those compounding losses around backwards into compounding savings from right to left, and every unit of flow or friction you save in the pipe saves 10 units of fuel cost emissions and what Hunter Lovins calls global weirding back at the power plant. And as you go back upstream, the components get smaller and cheaper, reducing the total capital cost. So always start your savings downstream. Start at the end. Start with intent, with purpose. Then your design logic flows back upstream in the opposite direction to the energy flow. Now let's apply this logic to big old data centers. Two thirds of the fuel fed into the power plant is lost in the plant and grid classically. And then half the metered electricity is lost in the cooling system and the uninterruptible power supplies. Those make up about half the total capital cost of the facility. And that's before it gets to the servers. 
but then half the server energy doesn't reach the chips because it's lost in inefficient, usually very underloaded power supplies and in lots of fans to take heat that largely shouldn't be there off the motherboard into the room where we can do dumb things with it. Then the next problem is severe underutilization of computing resources, partly through insufficient virtualization. Uh, now the resulting energy flow, the tiny yellow stalk at the lower right is about to vanish. So let's magnify it before it does. Next comes bloatware running many unnecessary threads and processes and making simple tasks very complex uh, because compute cycles were cheaper than programmers attention and someone else was buying the energy. Downstream of all that, you may even have inefficient business processes. So in all, looking at the red numbers at the bottom, a few hundred thousandths of the original fuel energy actually delivers customer value. So where should we start fixing this? Downstream. First, write elegantly terse code optimally compiled with the goal that every compute cycle is a needed and wanted one. I had assumed this might save an order of magnitude in compute cycles. Recent tests suggested it's two orders of magnitude and the shift to mobile services now makes this valuable because efficient code stretches battery life. Then we can at least quadruple the server efficiency, now even more, and the servers will need far less cooling and power supply, both of which can be done in smarter ways. We could even save half the utility losses by using fuel cell tri-generation cheaper upfront than the uninterruptible power supply it displaces. Well, <clears throat> Multiply these savings from downstream to upstream and you get at least two orders of magnitude potential energy savings. This uh, chart we made up for an actual project. Uh, well, the, the client rejected most of our recommendations which our partner EDS had uh, agreed with. So together we were only able to triple efficiency at the same capital cost. But EDS told us that had those agreed recommendations all been adopted, we would have saved about 95% of the energy and half the capital cost. RMI's 2011 business and design book, Reinventing Fire, showed how the US building stock, which uses three quarters of national electricity, can become three or four times more efficient by 2050, saving $1.4 trillion net present value with a 33% internal rate of return. U.S. industrial efficiency, too, can at least double with at least a 21% IRR. Thus, at historically reasonable speed, the U.S. could shrink electricity use 25% despite all electric automobiles and a 2.6-fold bigger GDP. This quadrupled electric efficiency would cost a tenth today's average retail price of electricity. So we should really buy far more efficiency than just fourfold better. And conservatively, this graph omits many savings from integrative design. Well, using electricity four times more productively also lets renewable supplies, which are now 95% of the world's net additions of generating capacity, displace fossil and nuclear generation more quickly and easily and economically. Meanwhile, mobility too, where most of the oil goes, can become far more efficient and profitably electrified. In 2010, that could get US mobility off oil completely at a 17% internal rate of return. That's an average cost equivalent to $18 per saved barrel. Well, now that's shrunk to just a few dollars per saved barrel. And within a few more years, it'll cost zero or less, saving oil whose price is currently spiking over $100 a barrel. Lots of money on the table. And this isn't only about electrification. The same integrative design logic works for vehicles as for buildings and factories and should be applied first before electrification. You see, most of the energy needed to move a typical car is caused by its weight, but every unit of energy we save at the wheels by reducing weight or drag saves about four or five units of fuel at the tank because we needn't waste several more units of energy delivering the fuel energy to the wheels. And now we can safely reduce automotive weight two or threefold by using ultra light but ultra strong materials without making the auto cost more. And we know that because BMW did it in 2013 with this carbon fiber electric car that I drive. It made a quarter million of them. It reportedly made money from the first unit off the assembly line, 
Sandy Monroe, the normally understated Dean of Automotive Costing, called it the most significant vehicle since the Model T and the most advanced vehicle on the planet. Validating our 1990s claim, its carbon fiber is paid for by the costly batteries that its lightness saves. You start to recognize the theme here. And of course, fewer batteries mean faster recharging from smaller infrastructure with less energy. The integrative design decompounds mass or snowballs weight savings far more than usually assumed. The manufacturing is radically frugal and confirms the elimination of the conventional body and paint shops, the hardest, costliest steps in automaking, and it's much better for workers. And it com competitively quadruples efficiency without compromise and with many driver advantages. This and 13 other empirical examples I found show that the technology by technology analyses underlying current policies make potential automotive efficiency gains look several fold smaller and costlier uh, than they really are if we optimize the whole vehicle as a system. Well, now the next efficiency leapfrog is already emerging. Two solar powered hypercars are expected to enter the market in 2022, both from firms I advise to declare an interest. Most drivers will never need to recharge this two seat electric vehicle because its solar cells on top capture enough energy to drive about 40 to 60 kilometers a day. It's as if your present car magically added eight liters of fuel to its tank each day you park it outside. To make a long trip, you can quickly recharge the tiny batteries with household electricity for ranges up to 1600 kilometers, a thousand miles. Now my BMW and Tesla electric cars outside are among the most efficient now sold, but this two seat vehicle with a very crashworthy composite body will nearly triple their efficiency to under 0.7 liters equivalent per 100 kilometers, or in the US, 343 miles per gallon equivalent. Then there's the Dutch firm Lightyear planning a five-seat, four-wheel, 725-kilometer range light aerodynamic car with five square meters of solar cells on top, 0.9 liters per 100 kilometers, or 251 miles per US gallon efficiency. And that can add 12 kilometers or so of range per hour in the sun. So the charging infrastructure that others must pay for, the, these super efficient vehicles aim to bypass. And even they can be further improved by lighter materials and recent fundamental advances in propulsion. Such magic requires, as Francis Bacon said, some new methods. So let me give you three. First, organize designers differently. Our hypercar carbon fiber electric SUVs basic design we did in 2000 used not a thousand plus engineers, but seven engineers all sitting around the same table and collectively responsible for dauntingly ambitious, uncompromised whole vehicle requirements like four to six fold more efficient with a retail payback under two years and half normal weight. Well, each engineer was responsible for one major vehicle system or function, but for those, we deliberately wrote no requirements because we didn't want him to make his problem into her problem. We wanted to make all seven engineers design a highly integrated vehicle together. Two of the engineers were not comfortable without their very own requirements. So we replaced them in the first week or two. Then it all went great. Toyota asked, how did you do that? We told them, out came their 70% lighter carbon fiber 1X concept car. Now. Secondly, to make a car half to two thirds lighter safely, you must go repeatedly around the design spiral or design cycle. First, you make the auto light and slippery. So you need uh, no more than half as much energy to move it. And that permits smaller and more advanced powertrain propulsion system and smaller, lighter chassis components, less suspension to hold it up, fewer brakes to stop it, and so on. Now, all that leaves more packaging space for comfort and more crush space for safety. But then you keep going around the spiral, making the components smaller as their structural loads shrink, because the less weight you have, the less weight you need. Many big parts then start to disappear, like a good series hybrid can eliminate, let's see, transmission, clutch, flywheel, drive shaft, U-joints, axles, differential, starter, alternators, and that's nine things so far, each of which saves even more mass as you go more around the spiral. And at, at first, the special materials and powertrain and design may raise your manufacturing cost, 
But after more mass decompounding, you need so little carbon fiber and powertrain and manufacturing that advanced composite structure can get so much simpler that those two savings pay for the carbon fiber, making the ultralighting roughly free as BMW proved. Third, such novel design processes flow from revolutionary design mentality. The leader of our hypercar team <clears throat> in 2000, Dave Taggart, learned at the Lockheed Martin Skunk Works to design in the future, not in the past. So when the Soviets shot down Francis Gary Powers' U-2 spy plane in 1960, their leader, Kelly Johnson, did not say, I'm going to design a slightly better U-2. He said, in paraphrase, I want to own the sky for decades, so we'll, uh, we'll design a Blackbird. I don't know how, but we'll figure out. And they did. It took about 13 months. That's because Johnson understood that such an airplane was impossible within the conventional design context. He knew the design is like a rubber band, an elastic band. If you try to stretch it too far from the conventional design space, you encounter more and more resistance and eventually it breaks. But if instead you jump to the new design space you aspire to, then you can stretch the band back to fit technologies not yet ripe. And then as they mature, the band relaxes to where you want to be. Better design and technology keep expanding opportunities, even in heavy vehicles too. We've known for over a decade how to make trucks three or four times more efficient, airplanes three to five times before electrification. Well, now Tesla's semi-electric truck, 40% sleeker, about the same payload because they partly lightweight it to offset the batteries. That roughly triples efficiency, I think a bit more, and with a two-year payback at low US fuel prices. Then there's this long range air taxi uh, that could fly nonstop from roughly Aspen to London with a sixth the operating cost and an eighth the fuel of a business jet before electrification. That and the bigger version looks set to blow up everyone's aviation business models. Oh, by the way, we can even make vehicle structures like airframes two orders of magnitude lighter still. NASA tested in 2019 a four odd meter test structure, 59 times less dense than a typical aircraft wing. It has the strength and toughness of bulk elastomers, but the gossamer density of aerogel. Eliminating movable flight surfaces, its whole shape adapts, it morphs continuously passively to optimize itself for real-time flight conditions like a bird's wing. Thousands of those identical anisotropic molded polymer cells can be assembled by swarms of program robots or grad students, whichever are cheaper, into an airplane of any shape, opening revolutionary prospects for lightweighting aerodynamics and cost reduction. The concept has been prototyped as a car for Toyota, as an airplane for Airbus. It could make a vacuum balloon, needing no helium, light enough when evacuated to be buoyant in the atmosphere without crushing, and lift two dozen times the payload of a jumbo jet. These lattice structures are made of common engineering plastics, but their performance could improve an order of magnitude with carbon fiber or two orders of magnitude with carbon nanotubes, which we can now pretty much make biomimetically. Finally, <clears throat> let me apply General Eisenhower's wise advice to make tough problems soluble by expanding their boundaries to encompass more options and more synergy so they embrace everything the solution requires. Thus, in making energy intensive materials like the steel and cement that now release 15% of CO2, before rushing to need less cooler, cleaner, and renewable process heat, what should we do first? Start with demand for those energy intensive materials. Need less, use other, use less, use longer, use again, align incentives. Only after maximizing need should we redesign the process then there's a lot less of it to redesign and, and rejig. This bigger system boundary can capture some immense opportunities that I synthesized in 2021 in the two papers at the bottom. Just smarter structural design can profitably save at least half of the world's cement and steel. Let me give you a few examples. Substituting tension for compression structures typically gives better strength, aesthetics, and cost with about one eighth the tons. Fabric forms permit optimal shapes that can save over half the concrete and beams, sheets, and other common shapes to deliver the same or better strength and stiffness. And then the weight savings compound because you need less strength to hold up less weight. 
This folded concrete roof, pre-stressed with carbon fiber, is just four centimeters thick, but it replaces the standard 30 centimeter thick steel and concrete slab. It costs less, it saves three fourths of the materials. This rendering of an airy bridge shows how 3D printing can eliminate most of the weight of massive concrete structures that mostly support themselves, uh, not their payload. This beautiful Dutch stainless bridge was 3D printed. So here's a summary of that fourfold more materials efficient roof slab redesigned as a loaded floor slab. Comes from one of the world's best structural engineering firms. The trapezoidally folded slab at the bottom is over twice as materials efficient as the standard optimization in the middle. And yet of all three, it, the trapezoid is the cheapest solution and it contains no steel to rust. You might wonder why should we care about floor slabs? Well, because they're about half the total weight of a typical mid or high rise building. These thick slabs also need more concrete in beams, columns, and foundations to support all that weight. Well, flat slabs are easily poured into simple prismatic formwork, uh, <clears throat> but they make no sense structurally. Look at the little drawings at the far upper left. Loading weight onto a flat slab makes it sag, so the top compresses and the bottom stretches. But concrete strength is far greater in compression than in tension. So most of that thickness provides little strength and over half the concrete gets cracked. Look how much thinner a curved vault or shell can be as shown below those drawings. Resisting load by compression with less stress, minimal cracking, greatly improved material efficiency. And now some British designers use 3D printed shallow domes as on the upper right, built up to a flat top by stiffening ribs or fabric formed thin vaulted shells topped with concrete foam. That eliminates 62% of the weight, 64% of the embodied energy. Oh, and you could also save about another 15% of core structural materials, 9% of glazing, three quarters of the energy, and much time and cost in a mid or high rise like the Singapore pilot project on the right, while increasing net rentable space by a stunning 55%. This three for two concept designs out a vertical meter odd of mechanical plenum, as you see at the far left at each story. So three stories with a normal 2.8 meter ceiling height fit into the same vertical space normally needed for two stories. Mechanical systems are designed out uh, or uh, integrated into other building elements like facade or interior surfaces, cost, complexity, and time fall dramatically, everything gets better. Why would you build any other way? So integrative design has immense potential, yet it's not normally recognized, taught, delivered, expected, or rewarded. Observing buildings, vehicles, and factories in over 70 countries over 50 years, I see the same design errors repeated everywhere because they're widespread in our textbooks, in our classrooms. So I'm hatching a plot for, to put it a mite impolitely, the nonviolent overthrow of bad engineering. Teaching disintegrated design condemns our descendants to perpetual retrofit of inefficient stuff. Not a worthy legacy. We've left them a lot of other things to worry about too. So to help us be good ancestors, I'm seeking fellow students, teachers, and practitioners to collaborate on making integrative design shift rapidly from rare to common to the standard default practice. I'd like to help retread in practice design professionals and those great tradespeople of pipe fitters, sheet metal workers, mechanical contractors who informally design many systems. I wanna help improve design software to allow and to coach integrative design and to find iconic CEOs to apply this work in their firms and spread the word to their peers as Jack Welch did with Six Sigma. I want to test the roughly 20 scaling vectors we've identified, seek more, see what works, and start scaling. No time to lose. I hope these little examples will encourage you to rethink why U.S. end use efficiency is only about a seventh what it could be, and global efficiency only one ninth. How better design and beginner's mind, child mind, original mind can help close that gap and how we can scale up to make integrative design as common as grass. Then the global energy transformation can move at the pace and the cost of design and software, not of infrastructure, and can be not constrained by the inertia of incumbents, but sped by the ambition of insurgents, like many of you. Thank you for your good work and your kind attention.